says is I had an interesting career, had a lot of fun in my life, and uh, now probably have the most challenging uh, job of any. For those of you who are sitting in the back row, I'd like to enter into a contract with you because I'm one of those that uh, put me in a room like this, I'm going to sit in back. But I'm fairly soft-spoken, so if you're having trouble hearing me, just wave and, uh, uh, okay, good, I get the head nod, so, so please help me with that because, uh, you know, I, my voice will sometimes just modulate out. So today I'm going to talk to you about a, a subject that uh, I'm really passionate about, and it's... Washington State, the people of Washington State, and what can we be doing here within our state given the fact that we've got uh, a, a very, very tremendous earthquake hazard facing us? What can we do to prepare? What level should we be taking at the state to get ready? What should local governments be doing? What should all of you be doing? And, and so, really, I see it all as a partnership. It's all of us working together, recognizing a tremendously difficult problem. How do we as a society come to grips with it? So before I jump into some of that, uh, I'm going to tell you stuff that probably already, that all of you already know. All of the world's biggest earthquakes, the magnitude 8s, the magnitude 9s, uh, occur around the Ring of Fire. And you can see that uh, kind of going all the way around the, uh, the, the Pacific Basin. And essentially, these quakes occur where tectonic plates come against each other. And, you know, if you look at uh, our recent earthquake history, we've had them in New Zealand, all the way through Japan, Alaska's had them, Chile's had them, even had them in Middle America. However, if you look at that map, there's no blue star up where we are. And so, is that significant? No, not necessarily, but it does mean that we face the hazard and we haven't had one in a while, and the longer that interval grows, the greater the probability that we're going to experience one increases. But a Cascadia type of event could occur within all of our lifetimes. So let's take a look at this. I asked uh, my geologic hazards team to put this, uh, this chart together. And it just gives us an idea of what the relative magnitude of earthquakes are in terms of, uh, in terms of ground shaking, but also in terms of energy release. As you think of a, the difference between magnitude 6 to a magnitude 7 earthquake, the magnitude 7 earthquake has 10 times the shaking, but about 30 times the energy release. So if you look at the, the small little dot here, you can probably all see it from where you're sitting. But if you take that and really make it about the head of the pin, that would be of scale to this larger red thing. So if you look at the magnitude of, of, of our energy release between the 6 and the 7, it's still pretty imperceptible. As you get up into the 8, where you've got a smaller rip of that Cascadia subduction zone, you're starting to get significant. But if you get that full rip, you're looking at uh, well over a thousand times the energy release at that magnitude 9 than you would be seeing in a magnitude 6. So let's take a look at probabilities over the next 50 years. And again, probability is not an exact science that, uh, uh, that uh, this is really what we're looking at. But in terms of a, a deep earthquake like the Nisqually quake or the, the one we had back in Seattle in the 40s, you're probably looking at within the next 50 years pretty darn good chance that one of those is going to happen here. So 84%, you know, is it 80%, is it 85%, is it 90%? Not sure, but to, you know, it, it is a reasonably certain thing that it is going to happen. As you get up into the magnitude 8 type of event, those happen more frequently than the magnitude 9, so probably looking at a 25 to 40% probability that somewhere along the Cascadia subduction zone, you could be looking at a magnitude 8 type of earthquake. And then as you look at the magnitude 9, the full rip that uh, Sandy Dalton wrote about in, in her book, within the next 50 years, a 10 to 20% probability. That's a heck of a lot greater chance of, your, uh, of that happening than you're winning the lottery, let me tell you. And so, again, I would hope that these statistics, and as you, uh, as you look at this, that it would spur you to some kind of action, because... Those are not odds that I would care to gamble about to, with something bad happening. And so we we'll just ask everybody to, to think about this. And, you know, I've been called the Dr. Gloom a time or two before, but think of what would happen 
if a magnitude 9 earthquake really happened. So we would anticipate significant ground shaking along the coast, probably magnitude 8 to magnitude 9 in our coastal communities. By the time we get to here to the uh, central Puget Sound, we're probably going to be shaking at about a magnitude 7 to about magnitude uh, 7.5. The big difference between that and Nisqually, Nisqually was just shy of a was just shy of a seven, cost a several billion dollars worth of damage. We had buildings fail. We didn't have too much of infrastructure fail. The big difference is the ground shook for 45 seconds in Nisqually. With a magnitude nine, we would be shaking at a comparable magnitude, but for about five minutes. And so, infrastructure that was on the verge of failing in that shorter magnitude 6 event will certainly fail in a magnitude 9 event. So I could have uh, thrown all sorts of charts and things up here that just show everything that's red, that it, you know, just uh, police stations. If you had every police station mapped in either red, yellow, or green, almost all the police stations in western Washington would be red or yellow. A few green because we have done some seismic protection of these facilities. The closer you get out to the coast, the more red. Same thing for fire, power generation, roads, bridges, wastewater, water, hospitals, nursing facilities. You know, anything that you can think of in terms of our infrastructure is going to be significantly <coughs> impacted. And, you know, I've, I've used the statement before that everything that we depend on to live our 21st century lives, uh, you know, the phones, the projectors, the computers, all that stuff is going to be gone. The infrastructure that supports it is not going to be here following a major earthquake of this type. And so that gives us a tremendous challenge that we as a society need to get our arms around. Having said all that, this is just the Puget Sound and the fault lines crossing the Puget Sound area. <clears throat> These things rupture on, on periodic intervals. And so if you had a rupture of the Seattle Fault, no, it's not going to look like Cascadia, but for downtown Seattle, the differences are probably not going to be that great. It, it would look in a more localized area what we could be seeing from a Cascadia type of event. So any number of these falls could cause more localized catastrophic damage. So that's kind of the, the setting the scene for what I want to talk about. So that's Cascadia, and in a nutshell, many of the problems that we're going to be dealing with. So we ran a big exercise back uh, two years ago. And uh, that uh, four years of work went into this. We had about 20,000 people participate. It was the biggest exercise in Washington State that, that I'm aware of. We had uh, tribal partners. We had cities. We had counties. We had state agencies. We had the federal government playing. We had federal agencies. We had the military. We had FEMA. Kind of an, an all, all of community type of event. What were we doing? We're trying to test the rudimentary plans that we had already built and put together for how we're going to deal with this big earthquake. Try and see what works, what doesn't work, and then try and pick some things that we need to work on going forward. And let me tell you, the exercise was an eye opener. Um, we had about four or five exercises uh, uh, going on at the same time, you know, for, for different agencies. You know, and I'm not going to talk about exercise design lessons learned. There were a ton and a half of those. <laughs> but what we were really trying to do was look at, out of the 37 core capabilities that FEMA's identified, we wanted to look at these six because we figured that these were the highest priority. So looking at how we coordinate with each other, how we communicate, how do we build situational awareness? How do you build situational awareness when you can't communicate? How do we take care of people? Big, biggest fundamental question, I think, of the day. How do we provide public health and medical? And then how do we provide critical transportation? So those were the things we were trying to zero in on uh, on this exercise. So I wouldn't say that we learned anything new, particularly about the earthquake, the hazards, and the impacts. I think that we all <coughs> read about it. You know, we, we, we all had that picture that I kind of described to you early about what was going to be in, what was going to be out, what was not going to be working, how to work around it. But I think that what the exercise really, truly did for us 
was a built perspective. It took it from something that was academic to something that was a lot more visceral, to the point where, okay, we really truly, I think, understood it at a much more emotional level, and were able to connect with the, with the challenges that we're going to be facing at a, at, a, at a much deeper level. It also took our understanding of a catastrophic event and turned it on its head. A catastrophic event is not just a really, really big disaster. So it, it's not a flood on steroids or, or a massive forest fire on steroids. A catastrophic event is something completely different. A, cat, a catastrophe, by definition, means that your ability to respond, your resources, your systems for dealing with it are completely and totally overwhelmed. At the same time, you're going to be facing tremendous pressures that you would not be facing in a normal type of disaster that you would experience every year in terms of the humanitarian pressures, the death, the loss of the, the, the injuries, the loss of income, the having to provide for the immediate needs, not just of small numbers of people, but extremely large numbers of people. And how do you do it when your means of providing for people are just frankly not there? So a catastrophe, and we have to understand that, and I'm not sure that we, we quite do as a nation yet, is completely different, needs to be handled differently, needs to be tackled with a different mindset. So the way that emergency management works in our country is that all disasters are handled locally. The local first responders deal with the situation. That, that, that's the way it's built. It's a, the National Incident Management System, Incident Command, all of that. We, we work by those principles. So the local first responders deal with an issue. When they need other resources, they reach out to mutual aid, see what they can find from their neighboring jurisdictions through their habitual relationships, through their agreements with partner agencies to bring in to help them. When those means are exhausted, then they turn to the next higher level of government for help. And that next higher level of government steps in. So if it's the county, the county steps in and provides resources and helps out. When the county can't handle it anymore, they call on the state and say, I, I need X, Y, Z. So I need, uh, I need a ton of generators. I need 10 truckloads of water, whatever it is that uh, they need help with. And then the state goes out and leverages its capabilities or its agreements to bring in the help that is needed at the local level. And then finally, when the state's resources are exceeded, then the federal government steps in and uh, provides help. Normally, for your run-of-the-mill disasters, that's going to be the financial assistance for rebuilding. But as we saw in, uh, in the disasters of last year in, in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Texas, Florida, federal government were also acting in a response role. And so we don't have time in a catastrophe to exercise that system. We don't have time to say, hey, I need this and this, and county, can you get that for me? The county going, no, I, I can't. Hey, state, can you get this for the locals? No, we can't. Hey, feds, can you help us out? We don't have time to do that. So we need to transition our entire response for, from a, for a catastrophe from a pull system where we are pulling resources down to a push system whereby we pre-identify what's going to be needed, and then there's a triggering event, it happens, and then those resources that we have already identified need to start flowing into our state and into our communities. And so that's what we're in the process now of trying to build uh, as a result of coming out of this, uh, coming out of this exercise. So, in addition to that, over, that overarching uh, lesson, we've got, I've got another couple of others that, I, that I'd like to walk you through. First, time is of the essence. We think that we may have time to be able to build a response and uh, to get in the resources. We're not going to have it here. Essentially, what's going to happen is the ground is going to shake, you know, roads are going to come down, bridges are going to come down, power's going to go out, communications are going to go out, water's going to go out. The problem is that many of the people that you are depending on to be your first responders may very well be victims. And, you know, this is not planning on my part, but I have a 50-foot drop to a creek at the foot of my yard. 
If this happens in February and the ground shakes for five minutes and I've got super saturated soil, I'm not 100% convinced that my house is going to be standing at the top of that hill. If it happens in the middle of the night, my wife and I may be in, the, in, in our house at the bottom of that hill trying to dog, get out of the creek waters. And, and you know, how many of us who are first responders or emergency managers are going to be in that same boat? And so, just our ability to mount an effective response is going to be extremely challenging. The other thing is, uh, as I've said earlier, the needs in this type of uh, event are going to be massive and overwhelming. Think of the nursing homes that are around the state, the, the elder care facilities. You know, what are their plans? What is their <coughs> ability to be able to, to survive on their own in terms of food, power, medicine? What about our hospitals? What about people? You know, we've, we've encouraged personal preparation. Our messaging prior to the uh, prior to the event was uh, three days, having three days of supplies on hand. You know, how many people have prepared? I, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet you that if I ask for a show of hands, how many people have three days' worth of supplies at home, less than half of you would raise your hand. If I asked how many have two weeks, probably only a couple of us would raise our hands. But, um, you know, what that tells me, though, is that we've got to meet the needs of the people quickly and figure out a way to do it, or we're going to have some very, very significant humanitarian pressures on our hands. Uh, and uh, it, it's going to dwarf what we saw in Puerto Rico uh, uh, last year. The second point is the overarching kind of what I would call concept plans that we've built so far are really not adequate to deal with the type of, uh, the type of situation that we are going to be facing uh, after one of these earthquakes. We've got to engage in a much more detailed level of planning that, than we have to date. And it goes back to that whole concept of the push logistics. We've got to go into the detailed uh, planning of community by community. What do you anticipate you, you need? What are you going to need on day one? What are you going to need on day two? What are you going to need on day 10? Where are you <coughs> going to need it? And then we've got to figure out, OK, Given what we know are going to be the challenges to the infrastructure, how are we going to get this individual community what it needs when they need it? And essentially, it's going, it, it translates really into a massive logistics plan and a logistics database that we need to figure out and build in advance. And that's kind of independent to opening the routes over which those logistics are going to flow, because that in and of itself is its own challenge. And that leads me to my next one. The transportation infrastructure is absolutely key. If we cannot get the transportation infrastructure open, we don't have a response. Flat out. And, and so how do we deal with that? And that's the Department of Transportation has been doing some absolutely fabulous work. They've got a, got a lifeline resiliency plan, and what they've been doing is uh, essentially ensuring that they are seismically retrofitting one direct direction of traffic between McCord Field to the south of Tacoma all the way up to Payne Field uh, in Everett. And so it doesn't go through downtown Seattle. It actually detours around Lake Washington and uh, up 405. They're looking at 90 and 520 being the primary logistics routes into Seattle. But they're seismically retrofitting all the bridges and overpasses and everything like that so that they've at least got one direction of traffic open that they can move logistics north-south between those two major aerial hubs. Great work. Fabulous. But when I talk about perspective, what the exercise showed me is, that's great, but what about the east-west routes coming into western Washington? It's great if we can move stuff up and down between Tacoma and Everett, but that's not going to do us any good at all if we can't get the stuff in here. So how do we do that? And so we were looking at in the exercise, so is 90 the best way to bring it in? Do you bring it in over 2? Do you bring it in over 12? Is the Columbia Gorge going to be the better way, bringing it in on 14 or 82? So again, these are questions that we still have to answer. But I think that it's something going forward. We really, truly have to figure out how we're going to get that east-west traffic, so to be able to get the stuff that's going to be building up in eastern Washington 
through the mountains into western Washington to the people who truly need it. So that's, that is road transportation. The next thing we need to be looking at, or not necessarily next, but concurrently, is how do we get airports open? Now, so you can say that McCord Field is going to survive the earthquake and that we will have a usable piece of concrete there that we can land a C-17 on. But, who certifies after the earthquake that that concrete is still good and you can land a C-17 on it? Because the Air Force is not going to put a C-17 on that piece of concrete unless they're sure it's, it, it's going to take that, that weight and it's not going to, going to crack up the airplane there. And then who's going to do that for all of the airports across western Washington that are part of our response plan. Who's going to do that to William A. Fairchild Airfield out in Port Angeles? Who's going to do it in uh, Olympia? Who's going to do that in the airport out in Shelton? Because the surfaces have to be inspected, have to be certified before you can put a certain, uh, uh, put a certain weight of aircraft on them. So we've got to come up with a plan on how we're going to rapidly open airfields or failing opening airfields how are we going to airdrop critically needed supplies in here? So you, you can see the complexity of the planning that we need to be going through and, and just the different challenges. So then we've got to be working and partnering with railroads, privately owned industry. How do we get the rail lines open? Because you can bring a whole lot more stuff in by rail than you can by truck. We're partnering with the Navy. Seven to ten days, they're going to be arriving and they're going to be able to drop ramps on the beach uh, out in Grays Harbor uh, County or Pacific County and start to um, ferrying supplies and, and needed assistance into those isolated coastal communities that, uh, that survived the tsunami that's going to come in after this event. So really, it's, a, it's an interdisciplinary approach, but we've got to get into that detailed level of planning. So how are you going to open the, the route? <coughs> How are you going to get the logistics, the transportation infrastructure up so that that massive logistics plan that you've built can then be put into place to get people uh, the things that they need here? Communications. If you can't talk to each other, again, you're not going to have a response. And so we need to, as a state, be investing in survivable communications. And this is something that the governor recognized coming out of this, uh, this exercise, and he's made a priority. And so we're working uh, with him on some solutions uh, that we can put forward uh, for a survivable communication system that will allow the state to be able to communicate with uh, cities and counties and tribes and uh, to a degree hospitals and schools so that we are able to share information and be able to uh, mount an effective response there. Public preparedness. I talked about three days uh, uh, three days of preparedness. As we came out of this and we were looking at all of these lessons learned, it became blindingly obvious to us, three days ain't enough. And that was what drove us to, to shift to the two weeks of preparedness and to be able to have two weeks of food, water, medicines, the things that you need to be able to provide for yourself for two weeks. Because let me tell you, help is not coming on day one. Help is not coming on day two. You may see the first uniforms on the street and maybe the first blue, uh, blue FEMA jumpsuits on the street maybe about day three or day four. But uh, in terms of being able to get massive supplies of food, water, and the other things that you need, it's not going to be showing up immediately because of all the problems that I've talked about. So you have to be prepared to, to survive on your own. Now, We've been accused of fear-mongering uh, or levying impossible uh, uh, expectations on people, but you know, public preparedness does not mean that you've instantly got to carve $500 out of your budget, uh, run down to, uh, you name it, to a grocery store, buy a whole bunch of food, water, cans of, of stuff, and where are you going to store it in your one-bedroom apartment or your dorm room or, or wherever. But, uh, you know, this is something that can be done simply a little bit at a time, an item at a time, a couple of bottles of water at a time. You got a few, uh, few extra dollars, go buy, a, you know, go buy a filtration system or, or something like that. You know, one of these little cups with a filter that gives give you safe drinking water. There are things that you can do that are not going to break the bank that you can do incrementally that can get yourself ready. If you're creative, space doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. But at the same time, we recognize 
There are going to be people out there for whom this is an impossibility. And so, again, our plans need to be able to take care of those who cannot prepare. But for those of us who can, we need to do it. Because that way we can take care of ourselves, we can potentially help our neighbors, and then we're not going to be a burden on the responders who really truly do need to be looking after those who are in desperate trouble. Finally, Cascadia really truly is a national issue. It's not a tribal issue. It's not a community issue. It's not an issue just for the city of Seattle. It's not just an issue for King County. It's not just an issue for Washington State or Oregon State or Northern California. It really truly is a national issue. We do not have enough resources in this state to completely mitigate the risks or the, 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 the impacts that this thing will have on our infrastructure. We need the federal help. We also need the federal help for a response. But I would also submit to you that it's not just a national issue. This is a global issue. Because if you look at the trade and the, the global economic impact, so how much of the trade from Asia comes through the Port of Seattle and the Port of Tacoma? And you cut that off, a Cascadia type of event could occur within all of our lifetimes. So let's take a look at this. I asked uh, my geologic hazards team to put this, uh, this chart together. And it just gives us an idea of what the relative magnitude of earthquakes are in terms of uh, in terms of ground shaking, but also in terms of energy release. As you think of a, the difference between magnitude 6 to a magnitude 7 earthquake, the magnitude 7 earthquake has 10 times the shaking, but about 30 times the energy release. So if you look at the, the small little dot here, you can probably all see it from where you're sitting. But if you take that and really make it about the head of the pin, that would be of scale to this larger red thing. So if you look at the magnitude of, of, of our energy release between the 6 and the 7, it's still pretty imperceptible. As you get up into the 8, where you've got a smaller grip of that Cascadia subduction zone, you're starting to get significant. But if you get that full grip, you're looking at uh, well over a thousand times the energy release at that magnitude 9 than you would be seeing in the magnitude 6. So let's take a look at probabilities over the next 50 years. And again, probability is not an exact science that, uh, uh, that uh, this is really what we're looking at. But in terms of a, a deep earthquake like the Nisqually quake or the, the one we had back in Seattle in the 40s, you're probably looking at, within the next 50 years, pretty darn good chance that one of those is going to happen here. So 84%, you know, is it 80%, is it 85%, is it 90%? Not sure, but to, you know, it, it is a reasonably certain thing that it is going to happen. As you get up into the magnitude 8 type of event, those happen more frequently than the magnitude 9, so probably looking at a 25 to 40 percent probability that somewhere along the Cascadia subduction zone, you could be looking at a magnitude 8 type of earthquake. And then as you look at the magnitude 9, the full rip that uh, Sandy Dalton wrote about in, in her book, within the next 50 years, a 10 to 20 percent probability. That's a heck of a lot greater chance of, your, uh, of that happening than you're winning the lottery, let me tell you. And so, again, I would hope that these statistics, and as you, uh, as you look at this, that it would spur you to some kind of action, because those are not odds that I would care to gamble about uh, with something bad happening. And so, would just ask everybody to, to think about this. And, you know, I've been called the Dr. Gloom a time or two before, but think of what would happen if a magnitude 9 earthquake really happened. So we would anticipate significant ground shaking along the coast, probably magnitude 8 to magnitude 9 in our coastal communities. By the time we get to here to the uh, Central Puget Sound, we're probably going to be shaking at about a magnitude 7 to about magnitude uh, 7.5. The big difference between that and the squally, the squally was just shy of a was just shy of a seven, cost a several billion dollars worth of damage. We had buildings fail. We didn't have too much of infrastructure fail. The big difference is the ground shook for 45 seconds in the squally. With a magnitude 9, we would be shaking at a comparable magnitude, but for about five minutes. And so, infrastructure that was on the verge of failing 
in that shorter magnitude 6 event will certainly fail in a magnitude 9 event. So I could have uh, thrown all sorts of charts and things up here that just show everything that's red, but it, you know, just uh, police stations. If you had every police station mapped in either red, yellow, or green, almost all the police stations in western Washington would be red or yellow. A few green because we have done some seismic protection of these facilities. The closer you get out to the coast, the more red. Same thing for fire. Power generation, roads, bridges, wastewater, water, hospitals, nursing facilities. You know, anything that you can think of in terms of our infrastructure is going to be significantly <coughs> impacted. And, you know, I, I've used the statement before that everything that we depend on to live our 21st century lives, uh, you know, the phones, the projectors, the computers, all that stuff is going to be gone. The infrastructure that supports it is not going to be here following a major earthquake uh, of this type. And so that gives us a tremendous challenge that we as a society need to get our arms around. Having said all that, this is just the Puget Sound and the fault lines crossing the Puget Sound area. <clears throat> These things rupture on, on periodic intervals. And so if you had a rupture of the Seattle Fault, no, it's not going to look like Cascadia, but for downtown Seattle, the differences are probably not going to be that great. It, it would look in a more localized area what we could be seeing from a Cascadia type of event. So any number of these falls could cause more localized catastrophic damage. So that's kind of the, the setting the scene for what I want to talk about. So that's Cascadia and in a nutshell many of the problems that we're going to be dealing with. So we ran a big exercise back uh, two years ago. And uh, that, uh, four years of work went into this. We had about 20,000 people participate. It was the biggest exercise in Washington State that, that I'm aware of. We had uh, tribal partners, we had cities, we had counties, we had state agencies, we had the federal government playing, we had federal agencies, we had the military, we had FEMA. Kind of an, an all, all of community type of event. What were we doing? We're trying to test the rudimentary plans that we had already built and put together for how we're going to deal with this big earthquake. Try and see what works, what doesn't work, and then try and pick some things that we need to work on going forward. And let me tell you, the exercise was an eye-opener. Um, we had about four or five exercises uh, uh, going on at the same time, you know, for, for different agencies. You know, and I'm not going to talk about exercise design lessons learned. There were a ton and a half of those. <laughs> Well, what we were really trying to do was look at, out of the 37 core capabilities that FEMA's identified, we wanted to look at these six because we figured that these were the highest priority. So looking at how we coordinate with each other, how we communicate, how do we build situational awareness? How do you build situational awareness when you can't communicate? How do we take care of people? Big, biggest fundamental question, I think, of the day. How do we provide public health and medical and then how do we provide critical transportation? So those were the things we were trying to zero in on uh, on this exercise. So I wouldn't say that we've learned anything new, particularly about the earthquake, the hazards, and the impacts. I think that we all <coughs> read about it. You know, we, we, we all had that picture that I kind of described to you early about what was going to be in, what was going to be out, what was not going to be working, how to work around it. But I think that what the exercise really truly did for us was it built perspective. It took it from something that was academic to something that was a lot more visceral to the point where, okay, we really truly, I think, understood it at a much more emotional level and we're able to connect with the, with the challenges that we're going to be facing at a, at, a, at a much deeper level. It also took our understanding of a catastrophic event and turned it on its head. A catastrophic event is not just a really, really big disaster. So it, it's not a flood on steroids or, or a massive forest fire on steroids. A catastrophic event is something completely different. A, cat, a catastrophe by definition, means that your ability to respond, your resources, your systems for dealing with it, 
are completely and totally overwhelmed. At the same time, you're going to be facing tremendous pressures that you would not be facing in a normal type of disaster that you would experience every year in terms of the humanitarian pressures, the death, the loss of the, the, the injuries, the loss of income, the having to provide for the immediate needs, not just of small numbers of people, but extremely large numbers of people. And how do you do it when your means of providing for people are just frankly not there? So a catastrophe, and we have to understand that, and I'm not sure that we, we quite do as a nation yet, is completely different, needs to be handled differently, needs to be tackled with a different mindset. So the way that emergency management works in our country is that all disasters are handled locally. The local first responders deal with the situation. That, that, that's the way it's built. It's a, the National Incident Management System, Incident Command, all of that. We, we work by those principles. So the local first responders deal with an issue. When they need other resources, they reach out to mutual aid, see what they can find from their neighboring jurisdictions through their habitual relationships, through their agreements with partner agencies to bring in to help them. When those means are exhausted, then they turn to the next higher level of government for help. And that next higher level of government steps in. So if it's the county, the county steps in and provides resources and helps out. When the county can't handle it anymore, they call on the state and say, I, I need X, Y, Z. So I need, a, I need a ton of generators. I need 10 truckloads of water, whatever it is that they need help with. And then the state goes out and leverages its capabilities or its agreements to bring in the help that is needed at the local level. And then finally, when the state's resources are exceeded, then the federal government steps in and uh, provides help. Normally, for your run-of-the-mill disasters, that's going to be the financial assistance for rebuilding. But as we saw in, uh, in the disasters of last year in, in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Texas, Florida, federal government were also acting in a response role. And so we don't have time in a catastrophe to exercise that system. We don't have time to say, hey, I need this and this, and county, can you get that for me? County going, no, I, I can't. Hey, state, can you get this for the locals? No, we can't. Hey, feds, can you help us out? We don't have time to do that. So we need to transition our entire response for, from a, for a catastrophe from a pull system where we are pulling resources down to a push system whereby we pre-identify what's going to be needed, and then there's a triggering event, it happens, and then those resources that we have already identified need to start flowing into our state and into our communities. And so that's what we're in the process now of trying to build uh, as a result of coming out of, this, uh, coming out of this exercise. So, in addition to that, over, that overarching uh, Lesson. We've got, I've got another couple of others that, I, that I'd like to walk you through. First, time is of the essence. We think that we may have time to be able to build a response and uh, to get in the resources. We're not going to have it here. Essentially, what's going to happen is the ground is going to shake, you know, roads are going to come down, bridges are going to come down, power is going to go out, communications are going to go out, water is going to go out. The problem is that many of the people that you are depending on to be your first responders may very well be victims. And, you know, this is not planning on my part, but I have a 50-foot drop to a creek at the foot of my yard. If this happens in February and the ground shakes for five minutes and I've got super-saturated soil, I'm not 100% convinced that my house is going to be standing at the top of that hill. If it happens in the middle of the night, my wife and I may be in, the, in, in our house at the bottom of that hill trying to dodge get out of the creek waters. And, and you know, how many of us who are first responders or emergency managers are going to be in that same boat? And so, just our ability to mount an effective response is going to be extremely challenging. The other thing is, as I've said earlier, the needs in this type of event are going to be massive and overwhelming. Think of the nursing homes that are around the state, the elder care facilities. You know, what are their plans? What is their ability to be able to, to survive on their own in terms of food, power, medicine? What about our hospitals? What about people? 
you know, we've, we've encouraged personal preparation. Our messaging prior to the uh, prior to the event was uh, three days, having three days of supplies on hand. You know, how many people have prepared? I, and I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I bet you that if I ask for a show of hands, how many people have three days worth of supplies at home, less than half of you would raise your hand. If I asked how many have two weeks, probably only a couple of us would raise our hands. But, um, you know, what that tells me, though, is that we've got to meet the needs of the people quickly and figure out a way to do it, or we're going to have some very, very significant humanitarian pressures on our hands. Uh, and, uh, it, it's going to dwarf what we saw in Puerto Rico uh, uh, last year. The second point is the overarching kind of what I would call concept plans that we've built so far are really not adequate to deal with the type of, uh, the type of situation that we are going to be facing uh, after one of these earthquakes. We've got to engage in a much more detailed level of planning that, than we have to date. And it goes back to that whole concept of the push logistics. We've got to go into the detailed uh, planning of community by community. What do you anticipate you, you need? What are you going to need on day one? What are you going to need on day two? What are you going to need on day 10? Where are you <coughs> going to need it? And then we've got to figure out, OK, Given what we know are going to be the challenges to the infrastructure, how are we going to get this individual community what it needs when they need it? And essentially, it's going, it, it translates really into a massive logistics plan and a logistics database that we need to figure out and build in advance. And that's kind of independent to opening the routes over which those logistics are going to flow, because that in and of itself is its own challenge. And that leads me to my next one. The transportation infrastructure is absolutely key. If we cannot get the transportation infrastructure open, we don't have a response. Flat out. And, and so how do we deal with that? And that's the Department of Transportation has been doing some absolutely fabulous work. They've got a, got a lifeline resiliency plan, and what they've been doing is uh, essentially ensuring that they are seismically retrofitting one direct direction of traffic between McCord Field to the south of Tacoma all the way up to Payne Field uh, in Everett. And so it doesn't go through downtown Seattle. It actually detours around Lake Washington and uh, up 405. They're looking at 90 and 520 being the primary logistics routes into Seattle. But they're seismically retrofitting all the bridges and overpasses and everything like that so that they've at least got one direction of traffic open that they can move logistics north-south between those two major aerial hubs. Great work. Fabulous. But when I talk about perspective, what the exercise showed me is that's great, but what about the east-west routes coming into western Washington? It's great if we can move stuff up and down between Tacoma and Everett, but that's not going to do us any good at all if we can't get the stuff in here. So how do we do that? And so we were looking at in the exercise, so is 90 the best way to bring it in? Do you bring it in over 2? Do you bring it in over 12? Is the Columbia Gorge going to be the better way, bringing it in on 14 or 82? So again, these are questions that we still have to answer. But I think that it's something going forward. We really, truly have to figure out how we're going to get that east-west traffic, so to be able to get the stuff that's going to be building up in eastern Washington through the mountains into western Washington to the people who truly need it. So that's, that is road transportation. The next thing we need to be looking at, or not necessarily next, but concurrently, is how do we get airports open? Now, so you can say that McCord Field is going to survive the earthquake and that we will have a usable piece of concrete there that we can land a C-17 on. But who certifies after the earthquake that that concrete is still good and you can land a C-17 on it? Because the Air Force is not going to put a C-17 on that piece of concrete unless they're sure it's, it, it's going to take that, that weight and it's not going to, going to crack up the airplane there. And then who's going to do that for all of the airports across western Washington that are part of our response plan. 
Who's going to do that to William A. Fairchild Airfield out in Port Angeles? Who's going to do it in uh, Olympia? Who's going to do that in the airport out in Shelton? Because the surfaces have to be inspected, have to be certified before you can put a certain uh, uh, put a certain weight of aircraft on them. So we've got to come up with a plan on how we are going to rapidly open airfields or failing opening airfields. How are we going to airdrop critically needed supplies in here? So you, you can see the complexity of the planning that we need to be going through and, and just the different challenges. So then we've got to be working and partnering with the railroads, privately owned industry. How do we get the rail lines open? Because you can bring a whole lot more stuff in by rail than you can by truck. We're partnering with the Navy. Seven to ten days, they're going to be arriving and they're going to be able to drop ramps on the beach uh, out in Grays Harbor uh, County or Pacific County and start to um, ferrying supplies and, and needed assistance into those isolated coastal communities that, uh, that survived the tsunami that's going to come in after this event. So really, it's, a, it's an interdisciplinary approach, but we've got to get into that detailed level of planning. So how are you going to open the, the route? How are you going to get the logistics, the transportation infrastructure up so that that massive logistics plan that you've built can then be put into place to get people uh, the things that they need here. Communications. If you can't talk to each other, again, you're not going to have a response. And so we need to, as a state, be investing in survivable communications. And this is something that the governor recognized coming out of this, uh, this exercise, and he's made a priority. And so we're working uh, with him on some solutions uh, that we can put forward uh, for a survivable communication system that will allow the state to be able to communicate with uh, cities and counties and tribes and uh, to a degree hospitals and schools so that we are able to share information and be able to uh, mount an effective response there. Public preparedness. I talked about three days, uh, uh, three days of preparedness. As we came out of this and we were looking at all of these lessons learned, it became blindingly obvious to us Three days ain't enough. And that was what drove us to, to shift to the two weeks of preparedness. And to be able to have two weeks of food, water, medicines, the things that you need to be able to provide for yourself for two weeks. Because let me tell you, help is not coming on day one. Help is not coming on day two. You may see the first uniforms on the street and maybe the first blue... Uh, blue FEMA jumpsuits on the street, maybe about day three or day four. But to, in terms of being able to get massive supplies of food, water, and the other things that you need, it's not going to be showing up immediately because of all the problems that I've talked about. So you have to be prepared to, to survive on your own. Now, we've been accused of fear-mongering uh, or levying impossible uh, uh, expectations on people, but... You know, public preparedness does not mean that you've instantly got to carve $500 out of your budget, uh, run down to, uh, you name it, to a grocery store, buy a whole bunch of food, water, cans of, of stuff, and where are you going to store it in your one-bedroom apartment or your dorm room or, or wherever. But, uh, you know, this is something that can be done simply a little bit at a time, an item at a time, a couple of bottles of water at a time. you got a few, uh, few extra dollars go by uh, <laughs> You know, go buy a filtration system or, or something like that. You know, one of these little cups with a filter that gives you safe drinking water. There are things that you can do that are not going to break the bank that you can do incrementally that can get yourself ready. If you're creative, space doesn't necessarily have to be a problem. But at the same time, we recognize there are going to be people out there for whom this is an impossibility. And so, again, our plans need to be able to take care of those who cannot prepare. But for those of us who can, we need to do it. Because that way we can take care of ourselves, we can potentially help our neighbors, and then we're not going to be a burden on the responders who really truly do need to be looking after those who are in desperate trouble. Finally, Cascadia really truly is a national issue. It's not a tribal issue. It's not a community issue. It's not an issue just for the city of Seattle. It's not just an issue for King County. It's not just an issue for Washington State or Oregon State or Northern California. It really truly is a national issue. We do not have enough resources in this state to completely mitigate 
the risks or the, 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 the impacts that this thing will have on our infrastructure. We need the federal help. We also need the federal help for a response. But I would also submit to you that it's not just a national issue. This is a global issue. Because if you look at the trade and the, the global economic impact, so how much of the trade from Asia comes through the Port of Seattle and the Port of Tacoma? And you cut that off. And let's say the Port of Long Beach or the you know, Port of San Francisco are not able, are they going to be able to pick that up? You know, what are, what are going to be, what's the impact going to be to the economy of Asia, not just the economy of our country? And so we will also, you know, in terms of a response recovery, probably also be looking globally, internationally, rather than just a, a response from, from the U.S. if we really truly do face this. So these are all things that we've got to think through and prepare for. So I could probably bore you for, for another uh, hour or two kind of talking about other lessons learned, but I'm not going to do that. A lot of those are in the weeds, a little bit more procedural, how do we communicate, that sort of stuff. But, you know, we came out of this thing. We, we, like I said, our perspective had been changed. We looked at the, we started looking at the event differently, and we were kind of sitting around the table with my staff and going, oh my gosh, what do we do next? And we're all kind of looking at this elephant that's sitting there, and you know, how do you eat the elephant? And the, you know, one bite at a time. So, what are those first few bites that we should be taking? And really, as we as we kicked it around, it kind of broke, kind of came down to what is the single most important thing that we need to be doing? We need to be figuring out how to take care of people. How do we meet the needs of people? Whether it's food, shelter, medical care. What do people need to provide health, safe, health and safety for, for folks? And so that kind of became our overarching priority. Now, in emergency management, we think in terms of emergency support functions. And these are kind of, how I would say, capabilities. So we kind of organize according to capabilities. And so emergency support function one is transportation. And it, this is all numbered. And there's about 16 of them that we, we habitually deal with in emergency management. So we kind of all boil down to those top two, six and eight. So um, mass care and sheltering, public health and medical, taking care of people. That's our single most important responsibility we saw in emergency management. So as we started building our plans, trying to figure out how do we, how do we respond to that, the, the lessons learned of this exercise, the starting point is how do we take care of people. Well, we realized that we could not do that without looking at a couple of other critical areas. So transportation. You, you heard me say earlier, if you don't have a transportation system, you don't have a response. So we have to concentrate and plan for transportation. How are we going to get the roads open? What can we do to mitigate vulnerabilities so that if the ground shakes, stuff stays up instead of falling down? So we need to, we need to be looking at transportation. We need to be figuring out how we're going to talk to each other. Now, it can be anything from ham radio within communities, talking to talking to, to the city, ham radio from the city to the county, ham radio from the county to the state. We've got the network. We, we, we have practiced the procedures, but it's limited. The amount of information that you can exchange that way is, 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 kind of is just a, a drop in the bucket. So really, how do we come up with a survivable communication system? And so that's what we're going to be investing in. And then finally, when we talk about energy, we're not looking at the entire, every aspect of how do we provide energy here uh, in Western Washington following the event, but just a couple of key aspects of it. One, how do you fuel the response? Because again, if you can't keep gas in the response vehicles, your response is going to grind to a halt. So how do you fuel the response? <coughs> And how do you provide for that ongoing fuel that you need here to be able to start getting back to uh, life in the new normal? And then the other one is working on pri prioritizing power restoration. So as the power does come back on, who gets it first? So it's not necessarily do we just power up the easiest neighborhoods first? Do you get public safety up? Do you get the hospitals up? How do you do this? And so we've got to be planning for that. But also, we've got to be looking at mitigation. Now, everybody is aware 
uh, I think of the budget situation in the state. It has been very, very challenging with, uh, with McCleary. There is not a whole lot of money in state government for anything other than McCleary. But we made a very clear message to the governor's office, to the legislature, hey, when we get McCleary behind us and the economy turns around, we need to be starting to focus on this. How do we harden our infrastructure so that either A, it doesn't break, or at least if it does break, it doesn't break as badly as it would today, and it can be restored much more quickly. And so how do we do that? And then we've got to, as a state, continuing to try, continue to try and build that culture of preparedness. How do we how do we mitigate on a personal level as opposed to mitigating uh, our infrastructure? And then finally, we have to have a plan to recover because if we just go into this without a plan to recover, then obviously we're going to fall flat on our faces. And so we've got to put some thought into how do we work recovery at all levels of government so that we can put that into effect immediately after the event and bring back our systems and our way of life and our, and our society that much more quickly. And the initial uh, look at that should be done uh, a little bit later this year. So I'm really excited to get that to going forward. So uh, I'm going to go through the next uh, few slides fairly quickly because I want to leave time uh, for questions. But I talked about detail planning, so at the state level, we plan on leading the, the planning effort. And it needs, to be, it needs to be coordinated across all levels of government. We need to be planning with our tribal partners, our cities, our counties. What do you need? How do we get it to you? How are we going to share information? How are we going to um, establish command and control? You know, uh, do we try and run everything from the state and every individual city, county, and tribe talks with us at the state EOC? That's probably not a good model of success. So how can we break this down into smaller uh, chunks or area commands within the state? We need to pre-identify the resource needs. We need to build that logistics uh, database. The five ESFs that I showed you on the uh, previous slide, we look at uh, probably three to four years to accomplish very, very baseline rudimentary plans for those ESFs, and then in the future years, continue to refine and uh, work on the other ESFs. Here's the problem. Pregnant pause while I take a, take a drink of water here. I have a staff of about one and a half FTEs to do that. <laughs> if you look at local government, many local jurisdictions have one FTE to do everything. So we are extremely under-resourced as a community for doing the massive heavy lift that we have here. You heard about my military background. You know, I was not a military planner. I was more a military uh, uh, operational type of guy. But when the military builds a, a detailed plan for how it's going to do something, they will generally have a planning staff of hundreds of people working on that. Kind of equate that to my 1.5 FTEs and the handful of fractional FTEs across, the, across western Washington. It's going to be a really, truly heavy lift. And so unless something changes in how we resource emergency management, our ability to get there from here is going to be extremely challenging. So, I'm just going to show this. This is the National Guard Response Plan, and a lot of work has been put into, into this over the last uh, five, six years. But essentially, what this shows is that there will be a massive logistics effort from the other parts of the country into eastern Washington, coming into Fairchild Air Force Base, into Moses Lake. Moses Lake is going to be the big uh, logistics hub. Then, from those... Um, Support bases in eastern Washington, things will be transshipped into western Washington. So if the roads are open, we'll get it onto trucks. I, I can see truck convoys coming through the passes and then fanning out into the communities. Absent that, it's going to be intermediate lift aircraft, C-130s and things like that, coming into the, op into the few operating airfields that are uh, still left in western Washington. Then 
stuff being further uh, transshipped by helicopter out into the communities, into the community points of distribution where things are needed. <coughs> Another interesting tidbit from the exercise. I was uh, talking with the logistics people in the middle of it, and I'm going, okay, what's your process, progress on getting community points of distribution on? And they go, well, we've identified 90 points of distribution here in the Puget Sound, and they were patting themselves on the back. I was going, okay, so how far are you expecting the father of a family of four to walk each way to go pick up his food and water and do that each day? Or the single mom with a baby? How's that going to work? And does 20 miles between sea pods really work? And so we've got some work to do there, too. And just, it, it's, it's got to go right down to the community level. So, you know, where's the, the point of the sea pod that's going to serve the University of Washington? And is the one that comes here and serves the school going to be the same one that serves the surrounding community? Or does the surrounding community get one? So, you know, what's the reasonable amount of distance that you would expect people to be able to travel to get their desperately needed supplies? And from there, it's just a simple overlay it on a grid on a map and then try and figure out what's going to be up, what's going to be down, and you can probably come up with where you're, where you're at least notionally, where you're planning on putting your seed pods, and then you adjust it based on the reality of the situation. But you've got to take a look at the individual needs and the capabilities of the communities you're serving. And it's not just a matter of we're going to drop one here, we're going to drop one there, we're going to drop one there. That's not going to work. We've got to come up with something that's going to be able to work to take care of the needs of the people. Now, not all planning is being done at the state level. And I just want to brag on Clallam County for a little bit. Got a couple of very energetic volunteers out there. And they're partnering with the county emergency managers and the uh, emergency managers of their cities. And what, what they've done is they've gone out and they've driven every road in the county. They've looked at the bridges, they've looked at the hillsides, <clears throat> they figured out what, what roads are going to be up. And basically, they, they figured where communities are going to be cut off from their neighbors. And essentially, they've broken the entire populated portion of Clallam County into islands. And you can see the breakdown from, the, all, from over um, east of Swim on the border with Jefferson County all the way around and down the... Uh, where, where the county touches Jefferson County again. I've broken it into islands. And these are going to be what they forecast as being cut off communities or cut off areas that are going to have to be self-reliant and self-sufficient. And so they are now partnering with each one of those communities to build certain capabilities to, in some cases, stockpile food and water or water purification mechanisms so that those islands could be self-sufficient. And there's work like this that's taking place in other communities across western Washington, but this is just a great example of people, you know, taking a very difficult problem, thinking it through, and then starting to figure out to what they need to do about it. And, oh, by the way, Collin County, their preparedness messaging is not two weeks, it's 30 days. <laughs> because they recognize it's going to be very, very difficult for stuff to get into, the, into their county. So beyond building the islands, now they're building uh, uh, further or you know, incorporating the islands into command areas, and then how are they going to command across the islands? And so they're really taking a very systematic, logical approach to how are they going to handle a very, very difficult situation. So they're being very proactive in terms of uh, uh, their approach to this. So here's some other things that are, that are going on. Legislation. We saw some gaps in you know, our statutory authorities and things that need to be fixed. So we look at the continuity of government planning. The way the law reads right now, you can only plan for and implement continuity of government in the event of an enemy attack. And this is separate from the prohibition in Washington state law that uh, uh, prevents us from planning for emergency evacuation in, in anticipation of a nuclear attack. <coughs> so different clause. And so 
what we're do what we've done is uh, work with uh, the prime sponsors of these bills to include the federal definition of catastrophic event and substitute enemy attack for the full spectrum of uh, catastrophic event, and then that would give us the capability to do a continuity of government planning for all uh, major types of hazards. Uh, there was a, a rule change uh, several years ago that limited the governor's emergency powers, and so we're looking at uh, redefining what the governor is able to waive in terms of statute. There was a bill that talked about school seismic uh, safety uh, assessments and uh, safety drills. Uh, I'm afraid that one's going to die. And then coming out of the resilient Washington subcabinet, which I'm going to talk about here in a, in a moment, um, the insurance commissioner is going to be running, if this bill passes, a work group to identify how what the best mechanism for the state is to tackle resiliency long term. The state of Oregon has a resiliency office. Is that the right thing for Washington? Maybe something different, but that's what this work group, which we will be participating in, is designed to do. I talked about the Wasatch Lifeline Corridors Initiative. We have a statewide catastrophic incident planning team um, working these regularly. Their latest accomplishment was they have built a template that uh, local uh, emergency managers can use as a guide for how to build their catastrophic plans. And then the Washington National Guard response plan uh, continues uh, to be developed. Resilient Washington was a document published by the Seismic Safety Committee back in 2012. And uh, it lists about 50, or pardon me, uh, 10 overarching recommendations that the state can uh, do to build its resiliency over the next 50 years. Following the exercise, uh, the governor stood up a resilient Washington sub-cabinet. And basically, that was to take a look at where are we in terms of building resiliency, where are we in terms of already implementing some of the recommendations uh, from the report, Where's, what are some of our gaps to, move into, to moving forward. Specifically, these are the things that he asked us to look at. We met with him to brief him kind of mid process and he added a couple more things he wanted us to look at in terms of schools and the communications. And so we provided him that uh, report back uh, back in late September of last year. And um, as I said, the first thing to come out of it was the bill for the uh, resiliency work group that's being run by the uh, Office of the Insurance Commissioner. And then uh, he's going to get back with us on uh, the, the other things that he wants us to take a look at. We can't sub cabinets uh, overarching recommendations back to the governor was to establish an office of resiliency a legislative task force so kind of those top two recommendations are being rolled up into that resiliency study and we're also going to end up with resiliency and results washington we're working with that group right now how do we do that so the sub cabinet has uh, borne some fruit and uh, i'm not going to go into all of the uh, uh, recommendations or reports out there but a lot of the individual state agencies are working on some of the lower hanging fruit to try and uh, get meaningful projects moving forward. There was another opportunity that came up right after the exercise. And the Department of Homeland Security does regional uh, resiliency assessment studies. There's one done uh, just recently on the Columbia River. There's one done in Alaska, how, how to work critical uh, logistics into Alaska. We were right at the window for getting a request in for a project, so we uh, pounded on the table with the uh, DHS and uh, <coughs> convinced them that this really would be a good thing. So DHS is partnering with us to look at our transportation infrastructure. So it's going to be everything from uh, eastern Washington, you know, starting uh, just east of the Cascades all the way through to the coast. So what are going to be the impacts to our transportation infrastructure? And then what are some things that we can do in terms of investments to mitigate? And then, you know, how can we prioritize? They're going to help us take a look at, uh, you know, how we can plan routes uh, immediately. So we know this bridge is going to be down. How can we, how can we uh, build logistics routes around those bridges and, and things like that? So that is ongoing. Very excited about that one. This is the two objectives of the RRAP. I've not, a lot of words on that slide. I'm not going to read it to you, but it just kind of talks about the objectives that I, talked, that I mentioned to you earlier. With that, we've got 10 minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Yes. I have a question uh, when you really really points on the probabilities. Uh, when you're reporting these probabilities, you said over the next 50 years, there's like a 10 to 20% chance of one of the like, do nine earthquakes. I was just wondering, I guess that's, that's kind of aggregating over a lot of different years, like the probability is it's going to happen next year because it's going to be a lot lower. I was wondering the variance in your estimate of uh, the probability over the course of a number of years must be increasing over time. So how, how does that affect uh, your calculations of, of those probabilities? To be honest with you, I don't think that the either we or the earthquake scientists are really going to be able to try and zero in on a probability that in any given year this is going to happen. We know what the approximate intervals are of these things. And as I said, it's anywhere from 200 years to 1,200 years. The last four, I think, if you look at uh, Goldfinger's work down in Oregon, have probably been on about a 300-year interval. We're 318 years right now. So it kind of just gives you a sense of where we are. We're in the window for one of these things, and the clock is ticking. But to try and pin, pinpoint a year-to-year -year rolling probability, I don't think anybody can do that. So do you know if the 300 years in memory was? Like, is it now just, is it just as likely that we'll have one next year than it would have been, you know, 200 years ago? Well, I think, again, if you look at the, the intervals, and I'm not a statistician, so uh, I could be leading you wrong with this answer. I think, though, that you know, as time goes, the probability that we're going to face one of these things increases. Sir? Um, <clears throat> I have a, a kind of a policy issue on a specific thing. In the first 30 to 60 minutes, on the coast, uh, there'll be a lot of death and destruction. Yes. Uh, not only because of the earthquake shaking, but also of a disastrous tsunami that strikes right. the coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, the UW has done a lot of work on vertical evacuation structures as a way of saving lives for people mm -hmm. that uh, don't have high ground or uh, can't get away from the coast for one reason or another. And I'm wondering what what what. I know the state is aware of this and they're aware of the vertical evacuation structure approach to save yes. lives. Well aware of it. And, but but is there uh, is there legislation or some kind of official policy or something that has to do with getting these structures built? Um, it's going to take a lot of money, uh, obviously. At this point, no. But I think that that ties right back into the comment that I made about mitigation. But right now. The focus of the legislature and all, essentially all the funding is on clarity and solving the state's education woes. Yeah. But at some point in the future, when that changes, and we are on better economic footing, then we need to be looking at a, a, a coordinated approach to mitigation and looking at the vertical evacuation. It definitely needs to be part of that because we are very, very supportive, at least in emergency management, of seeing those things go forward because there are communities for which that is really their only hope. Um, sort of a follow-up on, on the policy issue. And once again, I'm not having you defend the legislature because nobody quite frankly can do that. <laughs> Oregon and California for years have had policies for not only evaluation of K-12 schools, but also putting some money in Oregon, obviously taking the lead on that. What is the holdup year after year that you see, once again, this could be off the record, but what if the legislature not even wanting to study and tell us what schools are have which issues, you know, putting some funding in that, much less fix them? You know what? I mean, I, it died again this year, didn't it? Um, that that is private, private citizen. Yeah. yeah, as a private citizen, I understand exactly where you're coming from. I am not privy to the inner machinations of the legislature when they determine what is going to go forward.